I'm Dr. Mark Atala, and I want to welcome you to the 12th chapter of the OpenStack Psychology Textbook. Today we'll be discussing social psychology, what it is, things about attitudes and persuasion, conformity, prejudice and discrimination, uh, aggression, and pro-social behavior too. So social psychology examines how people affect one another and looks at the power of the situation. And it studies both intra and interpersonal levels. An intrapersonal topic would be things like emotions, attitudes, the self, and social cognition. And so intrapersonal pertains to the individual. Interpersonal topics are things like helping behavior, aggression, prejudice, discrimination, attraction, and group processes. And that usually pertains to dyads and groups. And we will talk about a situational and dispositional influence on behavior. So situationism is the view that our behavior and actions are determined by our immediate environment and surroundings. Dispositionism is the view that our behavior is determined by internal factors. And so these, these are the attributes of a particular person, their personality traits and temperament. In the United States, culture uh, our culture tends to favor a dispositional approach when trying to explain behavior. But social psychologists tend to take a situational uh, perspective and personality researchers a dispositional approach. So that's a picture of John Bender from The Breakfast Club, uh, which is a teen movie from the 80s. And the question really is, is he dispositionally a rebel or has it, have his life circumstances made him rebellious, or is he just an archetype that John Hughes is using? The fundamental attribution error is when people assume that the behavior of another person is a trait of that person and underestimate the power of the situation. So a question you could ask is, is this a universal phenomena or is it influenced by culture? Well, in an individualist culture that focuses on individual achievement and autonomy, people are more likely to commit the fundamental attribution error. In a collectivist culture that focuses on communal relationships with others, people are less likely to commit it. There's also the actor-observer bias, and this is a phenomenon of attributing other people's behavior to internal factors, so committing the fundamental attribution error, while attributing your own behavior to situational forces. So as actors, we have more information to explain our behavior. We know why we did what we did. But as observers, we have less information, and so we, devo we default to a dispositionist perspective. A self-serving bias is a tendency to take credit by making a dispositional or internal attribution for positive outcomes, but to make situational or external attributions for negative outcomes. So let's say you do well on a test. It's better to make a dispositional attribution that you're smart rather than a situational attribution by saying something like the test was easy. And it goes the other way too if you do badly you should make a situational attribution. Well, that was a really hard test and not a dispositional attribution that you're not smart. Um, attributions are beliefs about what the cause was. And those have three dimensions. So a locus of control, which is could be internal or external. A, the stability, which is uh, stable versus unstable. And the controllability of it, which is controllable or uncontrollable. The just world hypothesis is the belief that people get the outcomes they deserve. And so in order to maintain the belief that the world's a fair place, we think that good people experience positive outcomes and bad people experience negative outcomes. So this would be like blaming poor people for poverty and ignoring their situational factors that led to the poverty. And so people tend to commit the fundamental attribution error. So things like unemployment, lack of educational opportunities, a family cycle of poverty, all of these can lead to people being poor. But uh, many people will make dispositional rather than situational attributions. Why? Well, because it allows us to feel like we have some control over our life. Self-presentation is... Um, 
it's one major uh, social determinant of behavior, and that's our social roles. And so this is a pattern of behavior that's expected of a person in a given setting or group. And each of us has several social roles. So for example, I'm a son, I'm also a father, I'm also a son of a gun, I'm a college professor, and I'm a few other things too. A social norm is a group's expectation of what is appropriate and acceptable behavior for its members, so how they're supposed to behave and think. So for example, uh, what's appropriate on Facebook? Uh, what wakes up in a, what's an appropriate post, I guess, and what's an inappropriate post on Facebook? Personally, I still don't know if you can tag people in pictures or not. Is that considered okay, or are you not supposed to do that? I don't do it because I don't know if you're supposed to do it or not. A script is a person's knowledge about the sequence of events expected in a specific setting, and they're important sources of information to guide behavior in given situations. So, for example, in a restaurant, or there's a restaurant script, and there's a difference between a fast food and a sit-down restaurant. So kind of like uh, McDonald's versus the Cheesecake Factory. If you went to uh, McDonald's and sat down at a table waiting for the server to come over, you're gonna be sitting there for a long time. Uh, if you go to the Cheesecake Factory and walk up to the uh, counter and say, well, this is what I want, then they're gonna say, hey, go sit down and we'll send a server over to talk to you. The Stanford Prison Experiment was done by Zimbardo, and he wanted to show the power of social roles, social norms, and scripts, and also the power of the situation. So prisoners and guards uh, assumed their roles, and he started with 24 healthy male college students. Uh, what they found after six days was that the prisoners were supposed to, or, or became rebellious, they were throwing pillows and trashing their cells, and the guards were sadistic. They forced the prisoners to do push-ups and they gave them no privacy at all. Now the experiment was supposed to go for two weeks, but they had to call it off after only six days. It's a very famous study in social psychology. An attitude is an evaluation of a person, an idea, or an object, and it's usually positive or negative. It's made up of three components, an affective component, which is your feelings, a behavioral component, which is the effect of the attitude on the behavior, and a cognitive component, which is a belief or knowledge. So I may feel recycling is good, and I do, and that's my feeling. And so I, have, I save all my soda cans, which is the behavioral component, and I believe that I'm helping the environment, which is my cognitive component. So we like to feel good about ourselves and maintain a positive self-esteem, but we can sometimes experience cognitive dissonance. And this is the psychological discomfort that arises from holding two or more inconsistent attitudes, behaviors, or cognitions. This goes back to Leon Fessinger, and he says that when we experience a conflict in our behaviors, attitudes, or beliefs that go against our positive self-perceptions, we experience the psychological discomfort and we're motivated to, dis to decrease that comfort, uh, or that, excuse me, to de decrease that discomfort. That's not easy to say. So if you think smoking's bad for you, but you continue to smoke, you experience conflict between your beliefs and your behavior. So you think, well, smoking's bad for me, but I'm doing it. We can reduce cognitive dissonance by bringing our cognitions, attitudes, and behaviors into line by making them harmonious. So with the smoking example, I could say, well, smoking helps keep me thin, which is good for my health. And so maybe it's not too bad. And so that's, uh, those, that's having harmonious thoughts. Um, and I've known people who are smokers who try to eat uh, very healthily because they're like, well, I'm, I'm ruining my health with smoking, but I eat healthy. And so that's gonna make me healthy. That's, we're all kidding ourselves, I guess, is what it comes down to. The effects of initiations, difficult initiations into a group, uh, it influences us to like the group more due to the justification of effort. And so this is, the, again, goes back to cognitive dissonance. If you're in a military boot camp, it absolutely stinks. So people are yelling at me. Uh, it's really hard physically. Uh, but what I do is I tell myself, well, what I'm doing is important and I'm, becur I'm becoming stronger and a better person. And so... Um, that's how you're able to reconcile that. 
Interestingly, college courses, which required the most effort, were evaluated as being the most valuable um, also. What about persuasion? This is the process of changing our attitude towards something based on some kind of communication. And there's something called the Yale Attitude Change Approach. Uh, it says that certain features of a source of a persuasive message, so like the credibility and the physical attractiveness of the speaker, um, and that's one of the reasons why things people like actors and athletes are used in advertising. So that's the source of the persuasive message. The content of the message, and that could include whether um, it's important if both sides are presented or if you just present one side. So if people already agree with you, you just present one side of the message. And if, if, if people might disagree, you're supposed to present both. The characteristics of the audience um, also influence the persuasiveness of the message. Um, Features of the audience that seem to matter are their intelligence, their self-esteem, and their age. So research shows that people with moderate self-esteem are most persuadable, and people between the ages of 18 and 25 are most uh, persuadable, which is probably most of the people listening to this. Let me persuade you of something, the importance of psychology. The elaboration likelihood model considers the variables of the attitude change approach. And so uh, features of the source of the persuasive message, contents of the message, and characteristics of the audience are used to determine when attitude change will occur. And there's two main routes for delivering a persuasive message, the central route and the peripheral route. So the central route is logic driven and uses data and facts to convince people of an argument's worthiness. So for example, if you're buying computers and you might wanna base it on speed or you know how fast is the processor, how large is the screen, um, those sorts of factors rather than who was endorsing it. That's the peripheral route, is an indirect route that uses peripheral cues to associate positivity with the message. So instead of focusing on the facts and a product's quality, the peripheral route relies on association with positive characteristics, such as positive emotions and celebrity endorsements. And an example of this is product placement in movies and TV shows. And there's an, an old movie, uh, it was called A Few Good Men, it had Tom Cruise in it. And his character drinks uh, Yoo-Hoo and talks about how much he loves Yoo-Hoo. It's like a, uh, it's a chocolate milk flavored drink. It's not actually chocolate milk though. I don't think anyone in reality, in, in the real world, no one drinks it. But uh, in this movie, the character's just crazy about it. And I was like, boy, this has gotta be some kind of product placement. The foot in the door technique is when the persuader gets a person to agree to bestow a small favor or to buy a small item only to later request a larger favor or purchase a bigger item. So uh, there's a famous study where people who were willing to wear a save the whales pin were also more likely to be willing to put up a sign uh, on, in front of their house that said save the whales. Now, research on this technique also illustrates the principle of consistency. So our past behavior often directs our future behavior, and we have a desire to, main consist to maintain consistency once we've committed to a particular behavior. Well, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about conformity. And that's the change in a person's behavior to go along with the group, even if they do not agree with the group. Solomon Ash in the 1950s found that 76% of participants uh, conformed to group pressure at least once by indicating the incorrect line. And so the lines are off there to the right and you're supposed to say which one matches A, B, or C. And I think it's fairly obvious that it's C, but everybody in the group was saying, well, I think it's A. And so uh, the person in the middle of that picture, he's taking a good look at it. A confederate is a person who's aware of the experiment and works for the researcher. And confederates are used to manipulate social situations as part of the research design. And the true naive participants believe that the confederates are, like them, uninformed participants in the experiment. So he comes up with the Ash effect, and that's the influence of the group majority on an individual's judgment. So what are the factors that are related to this Ash effect, getting people to, uh, to conform? Well, the size of the majority. So the greater the number of people in the majority, the more likely an individual will conform. In Ash's study, 
Conformity increased with the number of people in the majority, up to seven individuals. And then more than that didn't matter. So eight or nine people didn't make any more, more of a difference. The presence of another dissenter makes conformity drop to near zero. And there's also an issue with the, pro the public or private nature of the responses. When answers are given publicly, conformity is more likely. And that's one of the reasons why we vote in private without announcing what our choice is. Compliance. Well, when someone's vote changes, if it's made in public versus private, this is known as compliance. And it can be a form of conformity. It's going along with a request or a demand, even if you do not agree with the request. So the question you might ask is, why do people conform? There's a normative social influence, and this is the idea that people conform to the group norm to fit in, to feel good, and to be accepted by the group. And with an informational social influence, people conform because they believe the group is competent and has the correct information, particularly when the task or situation is ambiguous. So in the ASH study, because the line test was not ambiguous, it would seem to be an instance of normative social influence. Let's talk about Milgram's obedience experiment. Um, Obedience is a change in an individual's behavior to comply with a demand of an authority figure. And people often comply with their request because they're concerned about a consequence if they don't comply. So Stanley Milgram was a social psychology professor at Yale, and he was influenced by the trial of Adolf Eichmann, who was a Nazi war criminal. Eichmann's defense for the atrocities he committed was that he was just following orders. Milgram wanted to test the, vol the validity of this defense, so he designed an experiment and initially recruited 40 men for the experiment. The volunteers, uh, participants were led to believe that they were participating in a study to improve learning and memory. They were told that they were going to teach other students who were called the learners correct answers to a series of test items by using a device to shock the learner if they gave an incorrect answer. Now, the participants gave, or believe they gave, the learners shocks, which increased in 15 volt increments all the way to 450 volts. The participants did not know that the learners were Confederates and that the Confederates did not actually receive shocks. So that is one of the teachers there thinking he's giving a shock. The Confederates cried out for help, begged the participant teacher to stop, and even complained of heart trouble. Yet, when the researcher told the participant teachers to continue to shock the learners, 65% of the participants continued to sh the, the shock all the way to the maximum voltage uh, and to the point where the, the learner was non-responsive. Now, several variations of the original Milgram experiment were conducted to test the boundaries of obedience. So when the setting of the experiment was moved to an office building, then the highest um, participants who were willing to give the highest shock dropped to 48%. When the learner's in the same room as the teacher, it drops to 40%. When their hands are touching, it drops to 30%. And this example, I don't ever understand because uh, I don't know how they didn't, that didn't cue them in that people weren't really receiving shocks because, you know, if you're holding hands with somebody and they get a shock, you get the shock too. When the researcher gave orders by phone, the rate dropped to 25%. So these variations show that when the humanity of the person being shocked is increased, then obedience decreases. And similarly, when the authority of the experimenter decreases, so does obedience. Groupthink is the modification of the opinions of members of a group to align with what they believe is the group consensus. And groups make more extreme decisions than individuals do. And so there's a lot of symptoms that make groupthink more common. So uh, when a group is focused on maintaining harmony or a group leader's directive or the group's isolated from other viewpoints, um, these all lead to groupthink. Um, Things like believing that the group is morally correct, that increases group thing too. Or if you think that the group is invincible. And so this happens sometimes, um, oh, with the fascist countries of uh, during World War II, they thought they were essentially invincible. 
Group polarization is the strengthening of an original group attitude after, dis after the discussion of views. So after discussion, there's a stronger endorsement of the viewpoint. Social facilitation is, occurs when in, an individual performs better when an audience is watching than when the individual performs the behavior alone. And this is typically a behavior that they're skilled at because people can do worse in front of others too. It really depends on the task. So like learning to drive, that's much better uh, if, you, if there's not a lot of people around. If there's a crowd of people watching you learn how to drive, you're probably not going to do very well. Social lo loafing, which it seems to be occurring in the photo, is the exertion of less effort by a person working together with a group. And this occurs when an individual's performance cannot be evaluated separately from the group. Uh, if you've ever done group work, perhaps you've experienced people who do social loafing, and maybe, that's, maybe it's you that's doing it too. The likelihood of loafing increases as the group size increases. But the opposite occurs when a task is complex and difficult. And this is because people perceive that the group needs their input. And so they're less likely to socially loaf. Prejudice is a negative attitude and feeling towards an individual based solely on their membership in a particular social group. And this is common against people who are members of um, an unfamiliar cultural group. And if you have people imagine themselves having a positive interaction with somebody from a different group, that can lead to an increased positive attitude for the group. A stereotype is a specific belief or assumption about individuals based solely on their membership in a group, regardless of their individual characteristics. And prejudice often begins as a stereotype. Discrimination is a negative action towards an individual as a result of one's membership in a particular group. However, people can also show positive thoughts for individuals based on group membership. So people um, like people who are like themselves. And so it could be something like gender, race, uh, your favorite sports team. So I grew up in Cleveland. And so if somebody's wearing a, a Cleveland Cavaliers shirt, which is the basketball team there, then I'm like, hey, that's something we have in common. So I might view them more positively. Types of prejudice. Uh, racism is uh, discrimination based on a uh, specific racial group. Sexism is based on uh, someone's sex. These are pretty straightforward. And somebody can show sexism towards their own or the opposite sex. Ageism is prejudice and discrimination based on age, and older adults are generally seen as, or often seen, as incompetent, weak, and slow. And homophobia is based on sexual orientation. So you may ask, why do prejudice and dis discrimination exist? Well, it could be learned from parents, friends, the media. Uh, it, we might have a self-fulfilling prophecy, which is an expectation held by a person that alters his or her behavior in a way that tends to make it true. So if your ex expectations of how students will do in a class, um, that can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Confirmation bias says that we seek out information that supports our stereotypes and ignores information that's inconsistent with our stereotypes. And we can also have in-group and out-group bias. So in-group, that's the group that we identify with. Prejudice and discrimination, um, because the out-group is perceived as different and less preferred than the in-group. And we can also have um, scapegoating, and that's the act of blaming an out-group when the in-group experiences frustration or is blocked from obtaining a goal. Um, and I guess I, I forgot to give the example of gender. And so we might say um, that would be um, an example of something like out, an out-group is um, people of the opposite gender and in-group would be people we identify with. Aggression is when you seek to cause harm or pain to another person. And we can talk about hostile and instrumental aggression. Hostile ag aggression is motivated by feelings of anger with intent to cause pain. So if you would get in a bar fight with a stranger, how common is that? Instrumental aggression is motivated by achieving a goal and does not necessarily involve intent to cause pain. So this is like a contract murderer. And I think we know how common those are. Now, men are more likely to show aggression, and there's an evolutionary theory 
that men like to display dominance. And there's also something called the frustration aggression theory, which is that when people get frustrated or blocked from a goal, that they become aggressive. Bullying is the repeated negative treatment of another person, often an adolescent, over time. So a one-time push on a playground would not be considered to be bullying. People who are more likely to be bullied are children who are emotionally reactive, children who are different from others, and uh, LGBTQ teens. Cyberbullying is repeated behavior intended to cause psychological or emotional harm to another person. And it's different from bullying because it's usually covert, concealed, private, and done anonymously. It takes many forms. This is cyberbullying, but it's more common in girls than boys. The bystander effect is a phenomenon in which a witness or bystander does not volunteer to help a victim or person in distress. Instead, they often watch to see what happens. And this is based on the case of Kitty Giovanese in 1964, who was killed and apparently a number of people um, heard it happening, although that is controversial also. The diffusion of responsibility is usually given as the reason for uh, the bystander effect. And that's a tendency for no one in a group to help because the responsibility to help is spread throughout the group. The greater the number of bystanders, the less likely that any one person will actually help. Prosocial behavior is voluntary behavior with the intent to help other people. And so altruism is a person's desire to help others, even if the costs outweigh the benefits of helping. And so they may disregard the personal costs associated with helping. Empathy is the capacity to understand another person's perspective, to feel what he or she feels. An empathic person feels an emotional connection with others and feels compelled to help. Now, there is, there is a debate, though, whether there is such a thing as pure altruism because um, some researchers think that we always help others, uh, that we're really actually helping ourselves at some level. Let's talk about forming relationships. The most important factor to forming a relationship is proximity. You're more likely to become friends with people you have regular contact with. Similarity is another factor that influences who we form relationships with. There's absolutely, I, I teach a romantic relationships class too, and there's really no evidence that opposites attract. Um, there's a tendency for us to form social networks and relationships with people who are similar to us. Reciprocity is the give and take in relationships. Hey, remember, relationships are a two-way street, and self-disclosure is the sharing of personal information. Uh, this may be obvious, um, but we feel closer to people who uh, we reveal private personal information to. There was an early um, psychologist named uh, William James who said that psychology is nothing more than the elaboration of the obvious. Attraction is different for different individuals. It's culturally influenced, yet according to research, there are some universally attractive features in women, such as large eyes, high cheekbones, a narrow jawline, and a slender build. For men, attractive traits include being tall, having broad shoulders, and a narrow waist. Body symmetry is generally considered more attractive in both males and females, especially facial symmetry. Social traits that are considered generally attractive in female uh, mates are warmth, affection, and social skills, and for males, traits including achievement, leadership qualities, and job skills. Um, I can tell you too, again, from romantic relationships, the number one characteristic that both men and women look for is kindness. That, that, go, that cuts across gender. People want to be with someone who is kind to them and who wouldn't want that. Um, there's also something called the matching hypothesis, which asserts that people tend to pick people that they view as equals in physical attraction and social desirability. And this leads us to Sternberg's triangular theory of love. This suggests that there are three components of love, intimacy, passion, and commitment. And he says that a healthy relationship has all three components, and he calls that consummate love, which is different from companionate love. And that's common in close friendships and family relationships because it's intimacy and commitment, but no passion. Romantic love is having passion and intimacy, but no commitment. 
and fatuous love is having passion and commitment, but no intimacy, such as a long-term sexual affair. I, I suppose um, that doesn't seem very common to me. Social exchange theory. Um, what determines whether we're satisfied with a relationship? Well, in social exchange theory, we act as naive economists in keeping a tally of the ratio of costs and benefits of forming and maintaining a relationship with others. So people are motivated to maximize the benefits of social exchanges or relationships and minimize the costs. So when the costs are too high or the benefits are too low, you end the relationship. Well, we can't help with your relationship problems, but I can help you with your APA style problems. So all of your APA style writing problems are easily solved with my APA style, Learn APA style book. So when you want to learn to write correctly or write right, consult my book and videos on Learn APA Style, which are about writing in psychology and the social sciences. Have a great day and thanks for listening.